Welcome everybody to the second uh, webinar. It's a special training on AI and data ethics. Uh, my name is Yolanda Gill. Uh, I am a principal scientist and director of AI and data science strategy at the USC Information Sciences Institute and a research professor in computer science and director of new initiatives in AI and data science at the Viterbi School of Engineering. I welcome you to this uh, special webinar. Today, we're going to talk about AI ethics, and we have uh, record, a recording of our prior webinar on uh, data ethics uh, from last week. Uh, we will be recording today's meeting as well. Our speakers today are um, researchers and experts uh, on uh, AI ethics, and we're very excited to be able to count on them to understand uh, and learn more about this topic. Uh, our first speaker will be Christina Lerman. She's a principal scientist at the USC Information Sciences Institute and holds a joint appointment as a research professor in the computer science department. Uh, Christina is trained as a physicist and applies network analysis and machine learning to problems in computational science, including crowdsourcing, social network, and social media analysis. She has studied how biases in data, for example, Simpson's paradox, and networks, for example, friendship paradox, affect our understanding of social systems. She has developed and co-teaches with Fred Morstetter a graduate level class on fairness and bias in AI. Sven Koenig will be our second speaker. Sven is a professor of computer science at USC. He's a member of the executive committee of the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics and Autonomous and Intelligent Systems. He co-founded the AAAI ACM conference on AI ethics and society in 2018. And he co-edited a special issue of the AI journal on ethics for autonomous system. Our third speaker will be Fred Morstetter. Fred is a research assistant professor of computer science at USC and a research team lead at the Information Sciences Institute. Fred's work focuses on social network analysis, misinformation detection, cultural modeling, machine learning, and fairness in AI systems. He has recently published on detecting polarization and cyberbullying in online environments. He has developed and co-teaches with Christina Lerman a graduate level class on fairness and bias in AI. Our fourth speaker will be Keith Burgard. Keith is a computer scientist at the Information Sciences Institute uh, at USC. He leads several projects covering the fields of network science, geospatial science, human biases and hate speech, and improving fairness in AI. He's a co-organizer of the InterSpeech 2022 special session on inclusive and fair speech technologies and is a PI in grants and co-author of papers on fair machine learning and impacts of biases on AI algorithms. Thank you for uh, presenting at this webinar and we look forward to hear from each of you. We will be starting with Christina. Go ahead. Thank you, Yolanda. I'm really excited to be here to share some of the uh, why we actually decided to develop this class about fairness and uh, bias and AI. Everybody can hear me? You can see my screen. Good. Yes. Uh, great. Thank you. All right. And I'll say that there's a QA window where you can post questions and we'll take questions at the very end after all the presentations. Okay, thank you. All right. So let's start at the very beginning. You know, what is ethics? Ethics refers to the concerns that humans have had since the time of Socrates for rather history. Uh, Socrates was one of the first to explicate it, to, for figuring out how to best to live their good life. How do we identify what a good life is, one that is worth choosing from among all the different ways that, of living that is open to us? Another way to put it, you know, what are the moral principles that are, govern our behavior? For example, the golden rule that many cultures have uh, about how you should act in societies can be expressed as do unto others as you have them do unto you. 
So what does it have to do with AI? Well, AI shapes how humans pursue a good life. AI makes it easier for some to live a good life, but it might make it uh, harder for others to live a good life. And this uh, AI affects all facets of our life from, from how we consume information, where we get information about recent developments like uh, that shape our democracy to our finance and markets. For example, algorithmic trading is being done now, carried out autom automatically, uh, pricing. It affects our society. Uh, this is just a couple of the examples from online dating sites to con con uh, conversational robots. They're now taking over all kinds of online supports uh, and phone support systems. AI is also making life and death decisions or is poised to make life, life and death decisions. So you're going to hear more about it from Sven, in Sven Konek's talk. Um, so AI brings benefits to some, but it might actually harm others. Um, and AI, AI ethics specifically examines how the, the positive impacts of AI, which we call benefits, and how the negative impacts of the AI, which are called harms, how are they distributed uh, among individuals and groups within our society? Technology is not neutral. Technology, including AI technology, can create widely disparate impacts, creating winners and losers or magnifying existing uh, inequalities. For example, AI automation has been very profitable for many companies, allowing them to replace expensive human labor with cheaper uh, software. Economics that show that the AI automation can explain much of the income inequality that we've been arising. I apologize, my connection seems to be unstable, so I might be cutting out a bit. So AI fairness, the field of AI fairness is burgeoning right now. It examines who is harmed from, by AI and who stands to benefit from AI. And from AI fairness, we can go to concepts of AI justice, in, uh, which can be formulated as how do we ensure that access and benefits to, uh, to the benefits of AI and exposure to its harms are distributed in the right way. So, of course, AI has many significant benefits to society. It can improve our understanding of the world. It can help us make sense of the vast quantities of data to, for example, to make better uh, drug, to discover better drugs or to make better, uh, to improve our life in many ways. It can improve social and economic efficiencies because once we understand the world, we can design it in, in a way to improve its functioning. Uh, it can help personalize and uh, interventions and decisions more precisely ta tailor the actions and interventions to be more effective in achieving good outcomes for specific individuals and specific groups that depending on their context and circumstances. So a lot of the excitement about, about AI has focused around this these range of uh, incredible range of benefits that AI can offer to society and to individuals within it. But at the same time, in the recent years, there's been a growing awareness that AI can also create significant harms. These harms could be to privacy and security. So even when you release large data sets to mine, to discover patterns, to mine them, even when these data sets are anonymized, they can be still be linked and merged with other data sets to reveal intimate facts about individuals, including their men medical and mental history, mental health history, their private conversations at work and at home, their genetic makeup and their predispositions, their reading and internet search habits, which might reveal their political and religious views, their sexual orientation, or other things they might otherwise expect to be hold if not secret, but then private to themselves. All of this data in, uh, information can be reconstructed without their knowledge, without their informed consent, and used in ways that individuals might not have agreed to and uh, even want to be used in that way. Additionally, uh, AI can bring harms to transparency and autonomy. So by transparency, we 
refer to the ability to see how a system works. And autonomy is a fundamental concept in, in, our, uh, in our democracy, but also in, in our research. Autonomy is the respect we have for individuals and their capacity to make their own decisions to, to govern their own future. And within research, this uh, the concept of the importance of autonomy is, is expressed through uh, informed consent that research subjects have to, about whom the data has been collected, they should know that they're participating in this. And we'll hear more about this also in science studies as well, because it's one of the fundamental foundations of what it means for uh, technology to be fair. In addition, uh, AI can harm fairness and justice. The errors uh, AI systems make, the inaccuracies might accumulate and be, uh, and be unjust. And these unjust or hidden biases in data can rest on falsehoods, on sampling errors, on stereotypes, on unjustifiable discriminatory practices, and I'll illustrate it later in my talk. So these, are, these types of harms are especially concerning when they affect legally protected subgroups. And other dimensions that people are now uh, uh, have decided that they're important for technology and for AI are explainability. You know, the AI system should not be black boxes. They should be able to exp uh, help us understand how the system arrived at its con conclusion, at its decision or outcome. For example, if the AI system is making loan recommendations, approving people for loans automatically, it should be able to explain why a, a loan was denied to a specific individual. Why is this important? Because individuals need to know what they need to do to change the outcomes of the system. How do we change decision? What do we need to change about your credit, your financial behavior, so that you will, you will be approved for the loan? So explainability is one, another dimension that is important because harm can be, uh, technology can inflict harm along this. Another dimension that is important is stability. When systems, AI systems are deployed, it should create uh, similar outcomes for similar in similar conditions. So if you're applying it to two different individuals, you should expect outcomes to be very similar. Um, if you will hear more about it from Keith Burkhardt's talk as well, is there are large variance in outcomes, like basically do AI systems bring chaos? Can, or can they rely on their predictions to be, or can they rely on the prediction to be stable? And also what are the unintended consequences of the AI systems? Finally, there's economic inequalities. I mentioned this already, that AI systems have been designed to replace workers rather than enhance their performance. And some researchers are now re recognizing the fact that income inequality has grown as a result of uh, increased uh, use of AI within that technology. So all of these uh, dimensions of harm need to be satisfied in order for us to build technology that we call trustworthy AI, that we can rely on AI to be our partners and make decisions, including in high stakes cases that we can rely on and trust that they will be in our benefit and will not harm us. So, um, so this is the basic overview of AI ethics. And now, but questions might arise, how is it possible for AI to create harm uh, to, to to be unethical, to act in an ethical manner. So one of the, at the basis of a lot of the harms that come out of AI systems are uh, the ethical issues in data. So ethical issues arise everywhere in the world of data because data, it's very collection, analysis, transmission, and its storage and use can often profoundly impact the ability of individuals and groups to live well. You know, this is the guiding principle of ethics. And this was best expressed in this, uh, expressed really well in 2014 when just the people, the, the dawn of realization that AI can bring harms as well uh, was issued in this report saying big data analytics have the potential to eclipse longstanding civil rights protections in how personal information is used in the housing, credit, employment, health, education, and the marketplace. In other words, uh, the civil rights protections that government has instituted in all facets of society, they can be erased or eclipsed by bad applications of, of data science and AI. These, these protections, these harms that AI can create are especially pro problematic when they affect protected classes. And U.S. federal law already defines what protected classes are. 
So race, color, religion, national origin, and so forth. So uh, if your system is shown to discriminate against the specific subgroups of people, it is illegal. Right? But illegality, uh, it can apply also, and fairness can apply, of course, to many other dimensions than these particular, to other categories than this one. And I should also, uh, it's also important to point out the way data is, the way the bias is encoded in data. If you just say like, okay, my system doesn't use race, so it, it cannot possibly discriminate with race. But in reality, because of the, the way the, 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 our society is structured, the way that all the variables are always correlated, the traits about individuals are correlated with other traits, it is possible to discriminate for the system to discriminate even if it's not using specific protected class as a feature in making its decision. So this is perhaps most famously illustrated in this practice called redlining, which is a historical practice which was the basis for discriminating based on race and in giving out uh, mortgages and home loans. Um, in, banks conspired with each other back in early parts of the century uh, to, to deny homeowners loans based on, now they wouldn't use race as a factor, of course, because that would be illegal, but they use the zip code uh, as, as the basis for making, approving or denying loan decisions. And this map of Los Angeles is showing this kind of red line zone where the banks uh, consider it to be higher risk for making investments or giving out loans in these areas. So people who live in these areas were denied uh, home loans. And what happens? What, what are these regions? Well, these regions were also areas where high concentration of uh, African Americans and other minorities lived. So the, race, the banks were able to make racist loan decisions based on other features which were highly correlated, such as zip code, which were highly correlated with race. So this actually brings up the, 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 one of the fundamental difficulties with using the data is that because of the correlations and because of the stereotypes and prejudices that are in, 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 in embedded in the data, it's hard to disentangle them to make the uh, truly fair decisions. So these types of biases that, that are embedded in the data they can actually then propagate through algorithms and algorithms can, can embed in worst case scenarios, algorithms can amplify the biases that exist there. So there's this type of uh, feedback loop is actually showing how the circulation of data to algorithms that make decisions or make the automated uh, predictions or decisions based on the data. And then people act on those predictions one way and that's this, their actions then create more data for algorithms to train on. So this feedback loop can, can act to magnify uh, the disparities and the, and the prejudices that already ex exist. And Keith Burkhardt will, will talk more about these types of biases and stability of algorithmic systems. Um, so in order to understand, so it is now responsibility of data scientists, AI developers, researchers, practitioners to be aware of these biases and try to remove them or understand how they affect our analysis. So Professor Morstetter and I have developed this class. We taught it for the first time two years ago, and now we're teaching it again this semester. It's the SACI uh, called, uh, I'll, I'll mention the class again later. But this class actually covers the type of biases, how biases can enter analysis uh, of and enter data and enter AI and, and the impacts that they have on how uh, the algorithms, the, the outcomes for the algorithms. And our class covers the four types of different data, the, the, uh, the biases that arise in four different types of data. So this is social data, that is basically like the kind of data that is used in make predictions about humans. So my, and, and, we should, and I'll give an example of that. So models learn from data to make predictions that might actually make wrong predictions that harm some protected subgroups. We also cover uh, language and how biases arise in language and text, and Professor Morsetter will talk more about it in his book, how sexist, racist stereotypes are encoded in the language models, uh, encoded in language, and then language models learn from these uh, racist language to make sexist and racist bias predictions. 
very popular another so data source that's very popular right now is images like uh, so there's been quite a bit of work that shows that image recognition can also be prejudiced against certain classes of people for example as i'll show you later they can make mistakes based on simply based on skin color and another uh, air, uh, data source source of data that is of special interest to me is networks and uh, my my own personal research explores how bias can arise in networks how privileged groups can receive more attention and prestige uh, based on the simple the structure of the network or how or the simple bias in the preferences for how links form so let me get you give you some kind of flavor for the topics that are covered in class by showing you how biases can arise in these different types of data so here's just a very uh, popular example that was actually featured in the story in new york times that's showing that uh, popular gender classification uh, uh, method is actually makes different types of uh, errors based on the gender and skin color so this algorithm is most accurate for white men. Only it only misidentifies the gender of one percent of light-skinned males. But when the same algorithm is applied to other groups of people, then its error rates increase. So, for example, for white women, the error rate of this gender classification goes up to seven percent. And for darker-skinned males, the error rate goes up to twelve percent. But it is performs worse in dark skin females where where its error is up to 35 percent so you can see the the fact that algorithms conclusions you should not expect that that they should uh, depend on gender or skin color of the people they're classifying but based on the kind of data the algorithm would train on in addition to the details of the training end up with this algorithm that that is essentially discriminating against by gender and by skin color uh, another interesting example Hello, so I'm back, sorry. Anyway, so, um, okay, restart. I apologize for the network interruptions. This is the world we live in in the COVID era. Okay, we so- We can hear you again, Christina. Okay, great, thanks. So uh, I wanted to especially talk about this Compass tool, which was uh, an uh, automated risk analysis tool that was used by judges in many jurisdictions to give a risk score to a defendant. And the defendant comes before a judge and the judge has to decide what to do with the defendant. Should they release them to, is it like a, a low risk offender, peaceful offender that can be released back into society? Uh, or is it a high risk offender that should be locked or, or some more steps should be taken to to lock up this person to make sure that they're not out in the society where they have potential to commit another crime. So, so this automated tool, which was developed by some criminologists in the, um, based on their research, was would would analyze the defendant's kind of features, their data, their history, their uh, demographics, and give uh, make a prediction. The prediction is this risk risk score. So if it was a, either low risk score or high risk score. And high risk score mean, means the algorithm thinks that the defendant will commit another crime in the future, and the low risk score means it won't commit another future. So ProPublica did this, um, wrote about this algorithm in 2016, and this received really a lot of wide coverage because their analysis showed that uh, this, uh, this automated risk tool can discriminate against blacks by, by skin color. So they had they how they showed it was actually to look at the data set about 7,000 people who were arrested in Broward County between 2013 and 2014. So this analysis was done in 2016. So they actually had the history. They knew whether these people who were assigned the risk scores whether they committed another crime in a in a time period from the time 2014 to 2016. So they basically knew what the outcomes were. Either the person committed the crime, which is this column, um, 
either the people the defendant committed another crime in the future or they did not commit a crime and they compared these outcomes which is detailed to predictions of the algorithm so uh, so whether the, it was given a, a high risk score the algorithm thought the defendant will commit the crime or it was given a low risk score i mean it wasn't was not would not commit the crime and so in AI and in machine learning, we evaluate classifications, predictions of a system using this kind of what is called confusion matrix, where we know we have true positives, meaning the algorithms said the person will commit the crime and the person did commit the crime in the future. Or there's false positives. So algorithms thought the person will commit the crime, but the person did not commit the crime. So this is a mistake the algorithm makes. So this is one type of mistake the algorithm can make. It can think it can, that the person will commit a crime. So the judge might, for example, lock up the person, not feel in society, but in reality, it, the person did not commit the crime. So there's a cost to the person, to the individual, if they're being unjustly incarcerated when they're a criminal. But there's another type of error that might happen. This is called so-called false negative. The algorithm will say, oh, this person is low risk. The person will not commit the crime. But in reality, they did commit the crime. So there's actually a cost to society if the this person is unjustly released, incorrectly released, and they will commit the crime and they'll be as a result in cost to society. So so this the so these algorithms you can actually measure how well they're making correct predictions, which is given by true positives and true negatives, and how often they're making mistakes, which is a false positives or, or false negatives, and who is making this, who is bearing the brunt of the cause of these mistakes. So once actually they looked at these mistakes, you can actually see significant racial disparities. So the algorithm ended up falsely flagging black defendants as future criminals at twice the rates for whites. So uh, let's compare these, these two charts. So this chart is giving and showing what happens to uh, what were the risk scores of defendants who did not commit another crime. They were peaceful defendants. This is the distribution score shown by broken down by race. So this is showing um, that whites were given lower risk scores, but the blacks were given high risk scores at more often than whites. And on the other hand, looking at defendants who did commit another crime, you can actually lo look at what the risk scores they were assigned, and you can see whites were given lower risk scores much more often, like. Uh, the ones who, you know, criminals uh, who did commit another crime, the whites were given a lower risk scores much more often than the blacks, which was the black bars here. So obviously the algorithm was discriminating based on them. Um, Fred Morsetter, uh, Professor Morsetter will talk more about bias that encoded in language and language models that learns stereotypes about humans and saying that uh, a computer programmer uh, is to a woman, uh, man is for example, that it associates technical job titles more closely with men and puts women closer to homemakers and, and nurses. So, and one of my personal interests is bias and networks, which is based on small individual, very even subtle individual preferences for linking to people who are similar to you versus dissimilar to you can actually shift the balance of power within the network quite significantly, making from uh, minority class having a lot of power to minority class, which is orange here, having little power. The size of the node here shows the power. Um, so this is the kinds of uh, data sources and biases, and we are covering a class called uh, data science cl class called fairness and artificial intelligence. We are trying to teach students not only how to spot, how to diagnose and audit the data sets for bias, but also how to mitigate these biases, how to decrease bias so that AI can make uh, predictions and recommendations that are less, that are non-discriminatory, that do not co cause harm, especially harms to protected classes of people. Okay, this is the end of my slides. Uh, thank you for, uh, thank you for uh, your attention and I do apologize for my connection difficulties. No problem, Christina, and thank you very much. Our next speaker is Sven Koenig. Sven, go ahead. You're muted, Sven. 
Okay, can everybody hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect, good. Okay, good. So I want to talk about ethical you, aspects. You, sorry, Sven. Do you want to turn on your camera? Oh, um, you're yes, presenting? of course. Why is... Sorry for all of the problems. How does that... that Remus autonomous cars have now driven 20 million miles on public roads and many more miles since then. So we have uh, clearly technology here uh, that matures more and more and is uh, close to deployment in some markets already deployed, although under human supervision. So why do autonomous AI systems raise ethical issues? Well, um, it is because of their properties. And so on the next three slides, you know, I wanna go through some of the properties that can make them problematic. So AI systems can process large quantities of data. They can detect regularities in them. They can draw inferences from them and they can determine effective courses of action. That's not by itself problematic, but they can do this sometimes faster and better than humans. And sometimes as part of hardware that can perform many different versatile in potentially dangerous actions. Now you would say, well, you know, if that's the case, then we need to validate the behavior of AI systems very carefully. But unfortunately, the behavior of AI systems can be very difficult to validate, predict, or explain because they're often very complex. They often reason in ways very different from humans and they can change their behavior even you know, after they have been designed and tested because they can change their behavior based on their experiences via machine learning. Now, given that the behavior of AI systems can be so difficult to validate, then at least we should monitor the behavior of AI systems. But that's also a problem because the behavior of AI systems can be very difficult to monitor by humans. For example, because they make decisions extremely fast. I mean, just think about buy and sell decisions on stock markets that are being made automatically in fractions of a second before a human can even grasp that something went wrong. So because of this, um, there's a bunch of ethical issues that are being raised by such AI systems. And here I listed the top ethical AI issues um, as identified by the World Economic Forum. And so let me just read them to you here. So they say that you know, some groups of people worry about what happens after the end of jobs, how do we distribute the wealth created by machines? How do machines affect our behavior and interaction? How can we guard against mistakes by AI systems? How do we eliminate AI bias? How do we keep AI safe from adversaries? How do we protect against unintended consequences? How do we stay in control of a complex intelligent system? And how do we define the humane treatment of robots? Now, if I look at them, you know, I think some of them like the last one are pretty futuristic. But of course, it's, it's important to know what the people care about. Now, what I wanna do in the following is, you know, I wanna talk about some of these issues and give you sort of some examples. And I wanna do this in the context of talking about two different areas. The first area is um, issues related to AI systems making good decisions. And the second area is related to the fielding of AI systems having a positive social and economic impact on our society. So let's get started here with the first area related to AI systems making good decisions. So this is all about value alignment. You need to align the values of the intelligent system to the values of humans so that intelligent systems will make decisions that we as humans consider to be good. So the, the question therefore is, um, how do we ensure that uh, the behavior of AI systems is consistent with social norms and human values? Now here we can look at philosophy, in particular ethics, 
right? That's a branch of philosophy. That's all about systematizing, defending, and recommending concepts of right and wrong conduct. And in particular, there is the sub area of normative ethics that studies how to determine a moral course of actions. Of course, philosophy traditionally has done that in the context of uh, moral causes of actions as determined by humans. But of course, we can learn from that. Um, and that also applies to uh, causes of actions as determined by intelligent systems. So for example, um, here are Resnick's eight principles of common sense morality. So these are guidelines. Um, so Resnick identified eight of them. So they say that in general, um, you should not harm yourself or other people. You should help yourself and other people. You should allow rational individuals to make free and informed choices. You should treat people fairly. So you know, equal situations should be treated equally. You should maximize the ratio of benefits to harms for all people. You should keep your promises and agreements. You should not lie, defraud, deceive, or mislead. And you should respect personal privacy and confidentiality. Right? And these might also be good guidelines for constructing AI systems. So I want to look at um, three of these, um, these guidelines um, in the context of honesty and transparency, safety, and fairness. So let's start with honesty and, and transparency. So here's an example. Um, so around the time that the movie Ex Machina came into the cinemas, there was a uh, user account that showed up on Tinder, so a dating website. Um, it was Eva, you know, the photo here is shown on the left. And, uh, you know, if you felt attracted to Eva, you could swipe right and then you could talk to Eva. Now, what they didn't tell you though, is that this was not a human being. This was a chatbot, a chatterbot, right? So a, a conversation program that can basically make cocktail party conversations with human users. And it was all a promotion by the studio of their movie. Now, this could raise issues, right? Because here you play with the emotion of the human users. Um, that thought that they were talking to this young woman here. But, but in general, right, I mean, you could imagine that you could use this, for example, to sell things to people. So that raises questions. Like, for example, should AI systems be honest? And that's a question, right? That's something that we need to decide. Should computers like chatbots here be allowed to pretend in some situations that uh, they are humans? Or maybe more generally, should AI systems be allowed to lie, right? For example, for a good cause, to say comfort sick or grieving people. Well, and while that needs to get discussed, if we look at the next two guidelines concerning safety and fairness, right? It's easier to see that, yes, you know, we want our AI systems to be safe and fair. So let's look at safety. So the question here is, how do we ensure the safety of AI systems? And by safety here, I mean reliability and robustness. Now in the context of self-driving cars, right? I mean, clearly safety is really, really important for this application because potentially there are lives at stake, right? If self-driving cars make wrong decisions. So in that sense, um, safety here is more important than for other autonomous AI systems, like for example, movie recommender systems. Right? If they make a mistake, then the waste to you know, two hours of your time because you watched a movie that you really didn't like, but at least no lives were lost. So safety can be very important. Now, if you look at the example here on the, on the slide, um, then um, this goes back a couple of years when researchers at Google were very interested in classifying animals from photos. So if you showed here the left photo, right? If, that, if you showed that to their machine learning system, it could figure out that we're looking at a panda with about 60% confidence, so fairly confident. So it's a good system. But then the Google researchers added a tiny little bit of noise um, to the photo, right? The noise is shown, shown here, and they just added sort of you know, tiny, tiny little bit, so it changed sort of all of the colors sort of a little bit. And the resulting photo here is shown on the right. Now, for us, it's basically no different than the left photo, right? I mean, it clearly shows the panda. Uh, but unfortunately, their system now said that we are looking at the gibbon, 
with almost 100% confidence. So it was fairly sure that it must be a given. Now, if, if I look at the, the, the picture, right, and I would say, well, you know, what, what am I looking at, right? I mean, it's sort of an, a furry animal, right? White, big, round head, you know, with black ears and black eye patches. It has to be a panda, right? A reason from very high level features. But one of the problems of these kinds of systems often is that they don't provide explanation capabilities. And of course, we want explanation capabilities, right? Maybe not when we classify photos to try to figure out which animals they show, but certainly, right? I mean, if the system were to, to recommend a treatment in a medical situation, right? The system should be able to explain why it recommends that particular treatment. But, but this particular example um, is actually very, very problematic in the case of self-driving cars. Because consider this, right? As a self-driving car, um, people will need to make sure that the self-driving car recognizes street signs, like the stop sign here. But if a little bit of noise, maybe in form of dirt on, on the stop sign, suddenly changes the classification, right, from stop sign to, um, uh, to right of way sign, right? That's very, very unsafe, very dangerous. And it's not just that mistakes are a problem, it also makes these systems very vulnerable to attacks, right? Because, you know, some people who wanna do some mischief could figure out that if you place a post-it note on a stop sign in exactly sort of the right place and the right angle and so on, right? That that makes suddenly the self-driving car uh, classify the stop sign really as a right of way sign and again, it's very, very dangerous. Right? So these are sort of things that we need to think about when designing um, autonomous AI systems. Now let's look at, at fairness. Um, and uh, so, so the question is, um, well, we, we clearly want AI systems to be fair, right? But what does it mean? And so um, if we if we define fairness for a second as the absence of bias, right? So then we need to ask ourselves, how do we ensure the, the fairness of AI systems? And uh, Christina talked about this already in the previous talk, uh, you know, quite a bit. I wanna give you a different example here. And so, so you know that when you look at websites, right? For example, you read news sites that, that often they show, you know, some ads. That's sort of how they make money. They offer you the service for free. Um, but when, when showing ads, right, the hope you would click on, on that ad and that makes them money. Now, more than five years ago, researchers from Carnegie Mellon University uh, could show that uh, at that time, significantly fewer women than men were shown these online ads that promised them help with getting jobs paying more than $200,000. Now, that's a problem, of course, right? Um, because if we look at, uh, say, higher level management positions, and most of the holders of these positions are male, right? It could just be that women didn't know about these jobs or didn't know that they could get help, um, you know, with, with applying um, for these jobs. And of course, we can't afford this, right? I mean, our society is based on we want to get the best person on a job, and we just can't afford to ignore half of the population. Now, notice that no one here said that. Uh, you know, the developers of, of, of the system here, we're trying to discriminate against them. No, um, what, uh, what the objective of these systems typically um, is, is they wanna maximize, they wanna show you an ad uh, with the largest probability that you will click on it, right? So I wanna maximize the click-through rate because that's what makes the website's income, right? But, but these biases can, can happen in the process if you don't think about this when we design the systems and, and counteract them, right? And so it's important to think about this. Now, in the context of the self-driving cars, uh, let's look at a very extreme situation here, a very tragic situation, uh, but sometimes these are the most helpful ones to think about. And so let's assume that the self-driving car here drives at full speed and suddenly notices a child running onto the street, say, after a wall. Um, and of course, it will immediately stop, right? But let's assume that already pretty close to the child, right? And so now it has two options, could break and go straight, which in all likelihood kills the child, or it could swerve away from the child and break, um, which crashes the car into a wall and in all likelihood kills the driver. Well, 
that's a, a very problematic situation, obviously. Um, but think about it, right? I mean, the car here can't ask the passengers or anybody else for help because that would take too long. Now you could say as a designer, right? I mean, well, you know, it's a difficult situation. I, I don't want to care about it when designing autonomous cars. You know, something will happen in this case, and it's tragic either way. But but clearly, it would be better to think about what the car should do, right? So that the car does what we consider, even though both situations are very tragic, what we consider to be the lesser evil. But that raises complicated decisions, right? So. So for example, I mean, is the car there for the human who purchased the car, right? They spent their money on the car. And does that give the car the, an obligation to take care of the person who, who purchased the car and its passengers? Or is it the case that the, the person who purchases the car and the people who get into the car have already implicitly agreed to the risk posed by self-driving cars? And because they have done this, is now the job of the car more to keep everybody else safe, right? That might not have agreed um, to, to take that particular risk. But if it is the, the second thing, then you know, would you buy a car that keeps others safe, but not you, the person in the car? Probably not, right? And that means that no one will buy such cars. And that means that the auto manufacturers can sell these cars and make money. Right, so, so there is already a push here towards a specific value system so that you can actually sell the cars. Now, again, if we wanna think about these situations, we can look at ethics again, right? Normative ethics here, and there are different schools of thought within ethics. Um, I list two of the major ones here, but there are quite a few others. Uh, there's, for example, law-based ethics or deontology. And that asks, what's my duty, right? In other words, what are the right rules or universal moral law to follow? And then there is a utilitarian ethics or consequentialism that asks, um, what's the greatest possible good for the greatest number or in sort of more modern terms, right? What does a cost benefit analysis recommend? Now, these are frameworks, right? Frameworks that help you maybe to figure out, you know, what the right thing is to do, uh, but it can also help you uh, to implement um, uh, like an ethics module as part of an autonomous system. So for example, right, in, if, if you wanna build it based on law-based ethics, then you could, you could uh, include the rules as sort of if-then rules, right? And artificial intelligence has thought about uh, rule-based systems or production systems, for example, that you could use. Or if you wanna build such a, an ethics module based on utilitarian ethics, then um, you could base that on utility theory, right? You could look at all of the causes of action, calculate the utility, and then implement the course of action with the highest utility. And again, artificial intelligence has studied this. Now, of course, one of the problems is that these are just frameworks, right? And you know, in order to implement something, you need to make these frameworks operational, and people are thinking about that at this particular point. But it turns out actually that philosophy for these self-driving car examples has actually even more to offer. Now, originally they were not thinking about self-driving cars, but what they were thinking about is an out of control trolley. Yes, the trolley, right? And with high speed, out of control, right? Um, it comes down this particular track, will go to the left here. And you see that there are sort of five people hanging out on that particular track and the out of control trolley, right? And we will just drive over them and very likely kill them. Uh, now, this is you here, right? You're too far away from, from those folks and just too noisy that you could warn them. But notice that you're next to a switch. You could throw the switch and then you divert the trolley um, to go down this track here, right? And there's still a person, so it's still a very tragic situation that will likely get killed now if you flip the switch, but it's just one person, right? And the question now is, well, you know, what, is, what are your values, right? I mean, would you flip the switch? Or wouldn't you? And so you can do experiments with people to understand their value system. Many people here would flip the switch and then you can change the situation, right? And say, well, what if the out of control trolley would kill a young child, but if you divert the trolley, it will kill an elderly person that was already very sick and would have likely died in two months anyway, right? And that gives you a better idea of, of the value system um, that people actually have. And 
there, there is commonality in, in the values um, that people exhibit in these kinds of very difficult situations. Now, in, in general, um, you need to ask yourself what design guidelines should you follow when building AI systems. Um, but you also need to ask yourself who's liable for incorrect decisions of AI systems, right? I mean, is it the, uh, the programmer, um, you know, that, uh, that built the, the reasoning system for the car? Is it the manufacturer of the car? Is it the person who sold the car, the car dealership? Is it the person who bought the car, who owns the car, or is it someone even different? And when and how should we provide oversight of the operation when possible? Now, in order to make sort of progress towards at least the first of these questions, um, there's the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems. And they have released a, a document on ethically aligned design. And they're also pursuing standardization efforts in that area. And so this document is all about guidelines for building systems that make ethical decisions, both to build better systems, but also to safeguard their developers from liability in case something goes wrong, because they can say that at least they followed these guidelines. All right, so that's all I want to say about this first area on you know, how, you know, what, what are considerations um, for AI systems making uh, good decisions. Now I want to briefly, just for a few minutes, talk about uh, this area of how do, we, how do we ensure that AI systems have a positive social and economic impact. So how do we ensure that AI technology impacts the standard of living, the distribution quality of work, and other social and economic aspects in the best possible way? And here I want to look at, at, at jobs. Uh, now, we have already seen, right, I mean, there's a lot of progress towards uh, self-driving cars. Um, there are the last percent or two, right, is always the, the most difficult, right? And for self-driving cars, that's how do we deal with severe weather, snow, ice, rain, um, and these exceptional situations given by construction sites or police regulating traffic. But, but you can imagine that highway driving is easier than driving in city traffic. And so the Los Angeles Times already more than five years ago had this, um, this headline that said that self-driving trucks could replace 1.7 million American truckers in the next decade. And the reason for this is that in general, AI techniques are increasingly commercialized they're often used for automation, and they can result in cheaper, better performing, more adaptive, more flexible, and more general automation solutions than more traditional automation techniques. Now, if we look at um, truck driving again, uh, in 2014, that's the, the last one that this website allowed me to visualize, um, you can see that the most prevalent job in many of the, the states of the US was actually being a truck driver. So this means that you know, if we can automate truck driving, you know, a lot of truck drivers might be out of the job. Now, of course, that's nothing new for automation technologies in general, including automation technologies um, that uh, came about because of advances in computer technology. So for example, here, right, I mean, we see uh, women that work for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, so not too far away from, from USC in 1953. And they were called human computers because what they did is they calculated, for example, rocket trajectories at a time where calculators didn't exist. And so they are credited with, uh, with having helped to launch the first American satellites, lunar missions, and planetary explorations. And of course, this job doesn't exist any longer. Um, it just went away. However, there's a difference, right, between this example and the truck driving example because um, here, you know, there were not too many human, human computers, there are many more truck drivers than this. And also, um, the human computers actually had a very skilled job, right? It wouldn't have been difficult for them um, to find another job, you know, when they couldn't work as human computers any longer. Uh, now, in, in case of uh, automated truck driving, of course, that also creates jobs, right? But they are more in maybe maintaining, uh, maintenance of, of autonomous trucks, right, or programming them. And that needs a very different skill set from the skill set of truck driving, right? And so, so we need to start with educational efforts early. We need to make sure that the current workforce keeps up with new technologies. So lifelong learning is important, but also that the future workforce, right, doesn't just get trained in the current technologies, but likely also the technologies, right, that will be 
that will be prevalent when they enter the job market. So that brings me to the end here of my talk. Um, I wanted to raise here a couple of ethical issues. And the reason why I wanted to raise them is simply because people like me, right? I mean, you know, who develop these technologies, we often get so excited about endowing machines with new capabilities. But we also have a responsibility, of course, right? A responsibility also to care about how these machines afterwards will influence uh, us as humans. And we wanna make sure that they, they influence us in a good way, right? And so therefore, when we develop uh, interesting new technologies, we should keep some of these issues in mind so that we make good decisions during the development. And that's all I wanted to tell you. And I'm looking forward to your questions at the very end of all talks. And let me turn it over to our next speaker here. Thank you, Sven. Our next speaker is Fred. All right. Yeah, uh, my name is Fred Morstadter. I'm going to be talking about ethics and AI, uh, some definitions, uh, some harms, and some of the work that we've been doing to kind of overcome them. All right, so it all starts with a question, right? So we have this research question that we want to answer. Um, how do we keep people on our platform for longer? How do we get more ads to be clicked? You name it, whatever it is. Uh, and what we often do is we go out there and we collect some big data. Um, maybe we go out and we collect it ourselves. Um, maybe we find some data that appears to be perfect for the problem that we're trying to solve. Then we take some of that data, uh, we hire people to annotate it, and with the annotations and the data, we have an AI algorithm. Okay, that's great. Wow, awesome. Uh, and we can do so many things with those AI algorithms. We can uh, bring order to the web. Uh, we can make platforms that keep people infinitely engaged, like on TikTok. Uh, we can solve the world's problems, uh, better understand uh, hunger, famine, things like this, uh, and we can get rich, right? We can make tons of money off of these algorithms by automating the world. Uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't always go this way. So that data set that you found online, it turns out that uh, it didn't really mean what you thought it meant. Uh, maybe it's not actually fit for the purpose. Uh, maybe it is, and it's just wildly biased uh, because you don't know how it was collected. Maybe when you collected it yourself, uh, there were certain design decisions you had to make that ultimately led it to be incomplete. Oh, and those workers that you hired to annotate the data, uh, they didn't quite understand the problem and they gave you noisy labels. Maybe they just did it incorrectly. Uh, and even if they didn't, uh, they brought their own biases to the table when they were labeling that data. Those things combined left you with an unfair AI algorithm. Um, of course, that's bad for the users using it. And as Keith is going to talk about, it's actually even worse because it creates this uh, self-perpetuating process where the people who interact with that algorithm generate biased results, which is then used as training data in subsequent rounds of training, right? Uh, so really not good. And what we want to do is we want to come up with ways to uh, char characterize uh, that unfairness, to measure it, and best of all, to, to overcome it, to correct the unfairness in those systems. Um, there are a lot of ways to go about this. Uh, there are a lot of ways to define fairness, uh, for example. Um, I'm going to talk about two here on this slide. So these are two kind of canonical definitions of fairness. So the first is what we call statistical parity. This is like the hello world of fairness definitions. So statistical parity says that you have two groups in your data. Uh, one is the, the historically privileged group. The other is a historically unprivileged group, a marginalized group. Uh, it also says that you have uh, outcomes that you're going to disperse uh, through your classifier. Some of them are positive, some of them are, are negative. So coming back to uh, Christina's compass example, a positive example would be getting bail, a negative would be not. Uh, what statistical parity does, all statistical parity does, is it looks at the way those positive outcomes are distributed. So here you can see an example. Uh, those folks in the blue got the positive outcome, the others did not. So in the unprivileged group, we have 10 individuals, five of them got the good outcome. In the privileged group, we also have 10 individuals and six of them got the good outcome. So 50% in the unprivileged group, 60% in the privileged, 
statistical parity difference says, hey, look, there's a 10% difference between these two groups. Uh, there's some uh, unfairness there. There are a lot of uh, criticisms that we could cast on statistical parity that I'm not going to go into in too, too much depth. Probably the most important one is that it doesn't really care uh, if it's right or not. So that's shown in the graphic here, right? So those not colored in stick figures, uh, they didn't really, they, they were not correctly categorized. Statistical parity doesn't care. Um, the second on the right is calibration. So calibration looks at uh, predictions at different levels. So again, with the compass example, there's like a 10% chance that this person will recommit a crime. Uh, what we do is we look at all of the times the algorithm said it's a 10% chance, uh, a perfectly calibrated algorithm, if you look at all of those times, 10% would have recommitted. Uh, so you can see there, there's that ideal uh, diagonal line, right? That's the, the perfect, perfectly calibrated algorithm. And the red one is just an example that kind of, kind of deviates. So as I said, you know, there are a ton of definitions of fairness out there. Uh, if you want to look more, uh, I would turn you to our survey, which is linked there at the bottom. Uh, first author is Nina. I see in the attendees list. It's awesome. Okay, so coming back to Compass and coming back to why these definitions of fairness are so important is because they can really tell you different stories about your algorithm. So ProPublica, when they did their, their survey on Compass, when they did their study on Compass, what they did is they were doing the analysis on the right. So they were looking at the distribution of these scores by racial group. And if you look at that, it looks pretty clear that uh, this algorithm is unfair. African-Americans are disproportionately being put in the higher violent decile scores. Uh, Caucasians are disproportionately being put in the lower ones. Not great. So they published this analysis and the company that makes Compass shot back and said, okay, but if you look at the calibration, it's actually pretty well calibrated. So if you look at the rates at which people reoffend based upon our scores, it seems to, to check out. And that really underscores the importance of looking at uh, these different measures. Um, another important point is that some of these measures do not, dis do not agree. Um, there have been formal analyses that show that uh, you cannot satisfy both of these definitions at once. So you have to pick one based upon the uh, application that it is you're most interested in. All right, so far we've been talking a lot about fairness in terms of allocation harms. So we have this, um, these, these uh, outcomes that we have to disperse and we wanna do that in as fair way as possible. Uh, so allocation harms are when a system withholds certain resources or opportunities from some groups. Um, and you know, Compass is a perfect example of that. Another great example would be a loan allocation system, you name it. What we've been looking into more recently are representational harms. So that's the way the AI system holds or represents certain concepts. And it, it turns out it can do that in such a way that is harmful to certain groups. And these can be a little more nefarious because we don't always have a resource we have to disperse. And we have to really look into the algorithm to see what's going on there. Uh, what types of uh, unfairness is it representing about certain topics? Or, or groups. So one way, one place that we were looking into this was in common sense knowledge resources. So common sense knowledge resources are a perfect application of that, uh, that diagram I was showing on the top slide. So thankfully people have curated these large common sense resources. What we do, what we tend to do is we tend to happily download those and include those in our AI system. What we wanted to know is, hey, you know, since this data is being annotated by humans, it's probably going to reflect those human biases. Uh, what biases are in there? To what extent do they exist? And how do we just generally characterize them? So if you're not familiar with common sense knowledge, common sense is uh, facts about the world that all humans are expected to know. 
Uh, we take the view that this should indeed be facts and not stereotypes or biases in terms of uh, favoritism or prejudice. So here are two examples uh, at the bottom here. So one fish capable of swimming, okay, sounds good. Uh, but this other one on the right, politician capable of telling lies. Okay, yes, politicians are capable of telling lies, but if we only assign that rule to politicians, that's going to create some bias in the way that the algorithm makes predictions about them in downstream tasks. So what we did is we took uh, a list of targets that are underneath some of those sensitive uh, attributes that Christina was talking about in her talk. Things like national origin, gender, religion, and profession. What we did is we looked at all of the existing rules around those particular targets, and we looked at the sentiment of those rules. And that's what you can kind of see in the top right there. Um, so we looked at sentiment and we looked at regard. If you're not familiar with regard, it's basically a more precise uh, version of sentiment. That's the high level takeaway. Um, as far as profession goes, which we have plotted individually there, you can see there are quite a few disparities. Things like CEO get a lot of positive relationships, not so many negative ones. On the other hand, we have things like performing artist, politician, judge, get a lot of negative rules, but not so many positive ones. When we aggregate this up, to the attribute level, national origin, gender, religion, and profession, we see that those disparities exist at the group level uh, as well. But it doesn't end there. Um, what we wanted to see is what happens if we take this data and apply it to a downstream task, build an algorithm with it, right? Uh, we took a pretty commonly used uh, knowledge graph completion algorithm, Comet. Uh, what Comet does is Comet takes a knowledge graph and it spits out more rules about how it thinks uh, it should go, should go forward, what's missing, so on and so forth. And we applied the same technique to those rules. So what we found was, uh, sure, those rules that it spits out are biased, which is what we would expect, but they're actually much more biased than the training data. So these biases are actually amplified in downstream tasks. Um, one more example is some work we did in named entity recognition, NER. So NER is one of these kind of canonical tasks in NLP. It looks to find proper, uh, proper nouns essentially in the data and characterize them under different types. Uh, one type is a, is a name, right, or a person. What we did is we looked at how well state-of-the-art off-the-shelf tools are at uh, identifying names. Uh, we specifically were looking at the difference between female names and male names. And you can see some examples in the top right of how it fails. So for example, rule number one, or example number one, Charlotte is a person. Uh, that's a softball if I've ever seen one, but the algorithm uh, screws up and it calls Charlotte a city, right? Um, number two, roughly the same thing happens. Number four, Rose plays with her dolls. Rose isn't even identified as a person there, right? And um, this, you know, if you, if, you, if you don't know why this is happening, I guess I failed to do my job. Uh, if you look at the data that is being used to train these algorithms, um, it is primarily news data, which disproportionately mentions male names. Um, and this is, again, a state-of-the-art algorithm that is, is failing because uh, it has these biases in the way that it's represented. Another example at the bottom, or really not an example, just pulling up to show how it happens across time. We looked at all of the male and female names given to babies from the census data uh, from the 1800s to now. This bias is always there for every year. Uh, and uh, Again, this is a state-of-the-art classifier that's, that's failing to, uh, to pick these up. Uh, so this really shows, you know, you know if, you, if you ignore these representational biases, your algorithm will be wrong, right? It's going to make these very like trivial, silly mistakes. So it's very important that we have data that adequately represents the problem. All right, so zooming out, we started with this. 
right? We say, hey, look, we have this research question um, and there are all of these problems that can happen at the algorithmic level. Well, there's actually more going on there than just this. So uh, this is a, a screenshot from a survey that I really like. This is the citations there at the bottom. And most of the stuff that we've talked about so far is at the bottom level. So here you can see where do the biases come from? That bottom right box is all about uh, the, the like analysis that we're doing, uh, building an algorithm, so on and so forth. Uh, these biases, they manifest at uh, these different levels, population biases, behavioral biases, uh, so on and so forth. I'll go into those in a little more detail uh, in a second. And then at the top level, uh, what is affected by these biases? Well, it affects the validity of our research questions, right? We wanna make sure that we're actually studying what we think we're studying, that we're measuring what we think we're measuring. And these biases in data can prevent us from doing that. Um, so I said I would zoom in a little bit on the second level. So here are some examples, kind of like food for thought about these different biases and places where things can go wrong. So population biases, uh, when the people under study do not match the population. So we as researchers tend to lean on social media data quite a bit. Uh, if you were to take a sample of Twitter data from Los Angeles, the average age of those users would be a lot closer to the average age of Twitter users than to the average age of people in LA. That's a problem, that's a bias. That's going to skew your results. Uh, behavioral biases, uh, so the features of the site dictate how it is used. Um, you can think you can generalize site to really any, uh, you know, any research area, uh, the, the way, the way the data is annotated is going to dictate how the annotations, uh, appear. We were just looking at an example where people could like highlight text when they were annotating the data. We notice all the weird ways in which that can, uh, perturb the results. Content biases are basically contextual behavioral bias. So especially if you're doing an observational study, you're lack, lacking a lot of context behind uh, what, how the data is being generated. Um, people talk differently to their, their spouse or their, their family members than they would to a random person on the street and you may fail to accommodate that. Um, linking biases, uh, people behave differently when they have 10 followers and they have when they have a million. Um, also, there are all sorts of biases that Christina was touching on in terms of uh, network analytics that we need to be aware of. Temporal variations. So user behavior tends to change with time as people become more uh, accustomed to interacting in a specific space. Uh, the, way they, the way they act is gonna change. We need to stay away, aware of that. Also redundancy. So the same content is being posted multiple times if we fail to disaggregate, that can be a problem. Also, it's important to note, uh, this is something that we talk about in our class as well, is that there are a lot of ways that researcher bias can uh, affect or skew results or lead to incorrect conclusions from the data. Um, so one very famous example is the Facebook emotion contagion study. Um, when they were doing the study, it was okay, but once the results came out, people kind of reacted to that and it changed the way that they behave on the platform. Um, other sources of researcher harms. So you can take a bunch of data about different, different people. You can aggregate it in ways that are either harmful or incorrect or lead to incorrect conclusions. So if a person buys a book about cancer and a wig, we may want to make certain uh, conclusions about their medical status, even though that might not be correct. Uh, secondary use, uh, that mission or function creep, it's kind of what I was talking about at the top, right? So um, the way we use a data set may not be the way that it was collected or for the, in the intents that it was collected. And sometimes we have to uh, account for that or overcome it. Uh, collecting embarrassing information, um, the data that we, we use, of course, has to be uh, taken care of or will uh, lose confidence and uh, distortion. So let's say a writer buys a book on the manufacturing of, of meth to write a novel. Again, some, some might wanna make conclusions from that, but it could just be background research. And again, the whole thing here is that we wanna make sure that we are uh, as correct as possible when doing this research. And these types of things will lead to incorrect conclusions. 
Uh, speaking of conclusions, here are mine. Uh, so when we talk about AI bias, it's almost always a reflection of human bias. Uh, there are tons of definitions of fairness out there. I provided you a pointer. Uh, these representational harms are uh, nefarious, can be difficult to detect. There's a lot of uh, research needed to understand where they can appear in different algorithms. Uh, these biases can be introduced at any step of the research process. And um, if you want to get your own hands dirty and uh, start in this space, some pointers, uh, the survey I mentioned, those books at the top are uh, absolutely fantastic. And um, this AI Fairness 360 uh, site created by IBM is really terrific. So they have a lot of these uh, very commonly used data sets and algorithms right there at your fingertips uh, to, get, to get to play with. Um, compasses in there, um, all sorts of a very uh, famous data sets for uh, fairness research. And if you have any questions, uh, there's my email. Thank you. Thank you, Fred, very much. Uh, please post your questions in the Q&A tab and we'll take them at the end. Our next speaker is uh, Keith Berger. Thank you. Um, so let me share my screen. So can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so today I'm gonna to be discussing uh, runaway feedback loops in AI systems. So when we say a feedback loop, what exactly do we mean? The idea of a feedback loop is that there's an interaction between users and their data and the model that interacts with them. And these models need data from users, but the models also affect user decisions making this a two-way uh, a two-way road. Um, so new potentially biased decisions that are biased from the model, for example, are then fed back into the model and the model sort of takes this, uh, the data at face value. To give you an example, let's say um, uh, you're, you're trying to figure out what kind of ice cream you like. And you might have an intrinsic preference for say vanilla ice cream over uh, Rocky Road ice cream is sort of, uh, at least my uh, interpretation of how to illustrate that. Um, <clears throat> so given ice cream, you will eat it no matter what flavor, but you have a slight preference. So the AI algorithm is saying, okay, well, given you've, you've picked it and you'll always pick it when I offer it to you, I'll only give you vanilla ice cream. So I obviously you may prefer variety or get sick of the same flavor, but the algorithm doesn't know that. So obviously um, this is one example of AI bias where you have uh, what you really prefer and what the AI thinks you prefer because it doesn't see sort of the whole span of, of what you might like. But obviously that's a very um, simple example. If, if all uh, of AI was just recommending ice cream, I don't think we would have much of a problem with it. Uh, the problem is when these runaway feedback loops uh, affect real important and critical decisions like where to put police and the or problem of over policing. So in 2012, this uh, um, uh, a company called PredPol was launched to improve policing by saying, oh, only police where crime is. But historically, there's been over policing in minority neighborhoods, meaning that uh, places with high crime are places where there's just more police and not necessarily where there's just more crime in general. Um, and so crime predictions would be based on bias data. And so we could ask, well, what impact does this have? Well, there's this really interesting paper by Insign et al from 2018, which made simulations of this. And they found that there was a dramatic over-policing of certain precincts um, just based on the, the, these biases even when you account for discovered or reported incidents, this is a consistent finding. And because again, the overplacing tend to happen in minority neighborhoods, this means that minorities may be unfairly targeted and potentially uh, this could defeat the purpose of PredPol because police are swarming into one neighborhood and leaving others without enough police, thus potentially increasing crime. But you, know, you need an experiment to be sure of this. But let's get back to AI feedback loops uh, in, in more typical scenarios. Well, one of the problems with AI is that, um, as shown in this really cute XKCD comic on the left, um, 
there's at least a, uh, a tendency for sometimes people to just throw a lot of data at a very big model and see what comes out. And if the prediction is high, then you're fine. Um, but this can create feedback loops in a number of scenarios. For example, banking loans. Previous work has shown that um, if there's a tendency for certain applicants to get a, a, a higher risk score for their loan or a lower credit score, uh, this could be uh, enhanced if this feedback loop continues with the algorithm. Or with bail, as Fred was mentioning, for example, that companies like Compass can use past bias data to determine recidivism risk. And of course, it's often used in recommendation algorithms. So your recommendations for videos are based on what other people have watched. And therefore, uh, if people don't see like the whole gamut of what they might like, there could be a feedback loop of only seeing certain videos and, and that's sort of a, a filter bubble. So what are the overall problems that we create given these sort of examples that I've showed? I think there's a sort of a quadrant of, of different possible issues. One would be fairness, that unfair predictions can create more unfair policies. Um, and this was sort of discussed uh, by Fred and by Christina. Um, filter bubbles also could be an issue, as I was mentioning, where people only see a small window of content. And if it's with, for example, videos or newspapers, that could increase polarization because you're not seeing the full span of opinions. Um, it can also potentially create chaotic trends. I'll give you an anecdotal example and also show this with some simulations. Um, and finally, it can potentially undermine the utility of AI, as I was mentioned with Predpol, Predpol uh, and it also as I'll show with some simulations. The feedback loop can actually create surprisingly poor predictions regardless of the actual quality of the model. So what do we mean by filter bubbles? The goal of recommendation systems is to offer you what you like and not show you what you don't like. So that's obviously a, a very like intuitive idea of what it should do. Um, but this goal implies that recommendation systems can also create these filter bubbles, which means that they force people to use, see less diverse content. <coughs> And they can potentially polarize users, as seen in this really these two interesting papers that came out recently. So extremism, uh, which is an ongoing problem, could be enhanced by recommendation systems because they could actually force people who are in one extreme or another to only see that certain content. The degree to which recommendation systems are a factor is still uncertain, but there's some evidence at least that it could be uh, affecting our behavior. Now, in another point I was mentioning was these chaotic trends. So let me give you an example, and, and not to hit on this particular example, because I'm a, a fan of this genre called city pop, but I think uh, there's, there's some evidence uh, that this is a, a good anecdotal example of, of where these algorithms can go wrong. So city pop was a genre from the 1980s in Japan, and in 2018, many people might recognize this uh, 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 picture on your right because that was the album cover for this song called Plastic Love, which was widely recommended in YouTube and suddenly made this one song very popular and, and thus the, the genre of city pop. Um, so it could be an example of artificial new trends. There's been a couple, uh, well, YouTube, of course, uh, doesn't let you see the algorithm. So we don't know why this suddenly became popular. Uh, a lot of different uh, uh, newspapers, at least, have speculated that this was an example of something that just happened from a change in the algorithm. So thus, recommendation systems can offer a new way to increase the popularity of content, whether good or mediocre. And there's some other work which has actually shown that you can potentially manipulate recommendation systems to get uh, to show content that you want to certain people. So this can be a two way street, both the algorithm showing strange content to people and people directly the algorithm to show certain content. So let's apply it. Let's apply what we've been discussing to a very specific example, uh, which is recommendation systems. While I say specific, it's also something that you may be very familiar with. If you've ever used Uber, Facebook, Twitter, Google, Netflix, or Amazon, you've almost certainly been using a recommendation system. 
Uber Eats would recommend to you what sort of food you might like. Facebook or Twitter organizes the feed that you see, not chronologically, but based on a recommendation algorithm. YouTube used to actually just give you uh, links that were that it thought were relevant, but now it's actually specializing those the, the ranking of, of websites, such that if you um, <clears throat> are searching for caves and you Google bat, it'll show you the animal. While if you have been searching for sports and you look at bat, well, it'll show you the, the bat itself. Uh, Netflix, of course, is a very good example because there's this so-called Netflix prize, which was trying to enhance its, its recommendation system. Netflix and Amazon both give you um, use recommendation systems to offer videos. And of course, Amazon, as you might recall from, if you've ever used Amazon, there's this so-called uh, 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 things other people have been buying sort of option on Amazon, which is based on, you know, of course, recommendation systems. It says, what have other people bought? Here's what we recommend you would like to buy. So personalized recommendation systems are clearly a common AI task. Um, and as I was mentioning, we can explore these chaotic trends and predictions in these systems. Um, but the sad thing is we cannot do it with empirical data because we cannot know counterfactuals and we cannot rerun the system. We wouldn't know necessarily how people would react if we changed some slight parameters. So we use simulations for this. Um, but the basic idea is that you have these, uh, uh, you use past, past user history and look at what other people have, have looked at in order to recommend new videos or, or new content of any sort. But um, let me give you an example of chaotic trends, which was based on a, a very interesting paper from Science in 2006. Um, and this gives you a sort of feel for it, which we'll extend in a moment. So, this paper was an experiment where they had people try to rank, uh, sorry, try to rate songs, and these songs were ordered by their popularity. The number of times other people would watch the song would update the rank of the song, or, or how it, uh, where, where in this long list people would see a particular song. So the expectation is that with this music lab study, good content would always be at the top. Popular songs would be good. Um, but they actually checked this by comparing the songs that people would rate when uh, songs were ordered by popularity to what people would rate when songs were ordered at random. And by ordering at random, they'd say, controlling for things like ranking biases, what would people really like? What would people choose? Um, and importantly, just like in any recommendation system, this algorithm uses past decisions to rank content. It's just that everyone is seeing the same content. Um, and the result is that uh, a, a just sort of random chance, a lot of features besides the actual quality of songs would dictate what people see, how the songs are ranked. And then if you were to repeat this experiment again and again, the uh, rate, uh, ranking of the song could be very, very popular or very, very unpopular, very random, very unpredictable scenarios. Um, and also what is popular is not necessarily what is good when they have this sort of quality proxy of music, they find a non-linear non and very noisy trend for the relationship between popular and good songs. Thus, it's really that you're not finding the best songs, you're just finding songs. And, and it sort of defeats the purpose of, of these, this particular ranking algorithm. But um, obviously, this is not what you see with Uber Eats or with Amazon, those are so-called personalized recommendation systems. So how do they work with those more typical personalized recommendations? So what I mean by this is, imagine you have a bunch of people like uh, in this figure in the bottom, you have users and you have items. Uh, users may have, like different types of ice cream, for example. The goal of these AI algorithms is to typically predict what would people like uh, among the options that they have not chosen yet. For example, this red-shirted person has not had Rocky Road ice cream. Do you think they'll like it or they won't? Or this blue-shirted person ha has not chosen strawberry ice cream, but you'll notice that they like the same things that this green-shirted guy likes. So the AI algorithm may say that because the green-shirted guy doesn't like strawberry ice cream, 
the blue shirt guy won't like it. And so it will not recommend that ice cream. Um, but, you know, who knows if that's true? Um, they're sort of, the, the models make an assumption uh, and then that's affecting what content say or what, what things this blue shirt guy sees and then that's fed back into the model. And so you can see a clear feedback loop of data being fed into the model and the model being making recommendations that are fed back into the users who are making more data. So let's audit this by simulating how a feedback loop system works. And so this is what uh, <clears throat> a model I created, uh, which uh, you can see this code uh, on the bottom left. I should also say the paper is coming out in two or three hours on archive. So I'm happy to link it after uh, this presentation. Um, the idea is that you have this teacher student model framework. And by that, I mean, you have a teacher model that simulates how people will choose, say videos, how people will choose content. And then you have a student model that looks at the data being fed to it from the teacher model and tries to sort of impersonate the, the teacher model, tries to figure out how will people behave and use that, the, that behavior to recommend new content. So for example, it's seeing that, oh, people really are liking this particular video and this other person likes that particular video. So we'll recommend similar videos. Um, in a little more detail, this teacher model has certain biases, uh, it fed in, uh, uh, human biases that, that people have, as well as sort of it, it, people, uh, it allows Asians to choose content due to the intrinsic features of these items. Say, you know, you're, the biases might be, oh, it, it chooses, uh, you know, an Asian may choose this video at random and the user and item features are, you know, but still this particular person likes action movies and that particular person likes romantic comedies. So um, the, the biases are actually based on another paper that I won't get into, but we can vary this parameter a lot and the results are pretty consistent as I'll show. Um, and then we have the student model, which is a little bit simpler to understand, which is just simply, it sees data and tries to model it. That's really all you need to worry about here. Um, and then it, and it uses the model to make new recommendations. And then the model is retrained on this old data plus the new data that comes in. So this is a simplified version of typical systems because we have people only give two types of ratings, good or bad, or watch or don't. And all users make same, uh, the same, uh, all users make decisions, uh, et cetera. So there, there's um, simplifications we make for the simulation, um, but we expect uh, results would be robust to say adding more realism. So we actually find that this creates uh, as we would expect, um, or, or maybe not as we would expect, um, a lot of chaos. So um, when I say chaotic trends, I mean, when you rerun this simulation, we find that uh, if you just recommend the best content, and that's what I call the greedy strategy, uh, sometimes a, an item is very popular, sometimes it's unpopular, just like what we saw with an earlier experiment, but now for uh, these uh, personalized recommendations. Um, on the other hand, there's another strategy, which I call the epsilon greedy strategy, which is where you sometimes recommend random or unexpected content. And you would think at first that that's a bad idea, right? You're adding noise into the system. You're just sort of saying, I think you'll like action movies, but let me recommend to you a romantic comedy and see what you do. But in allowing for people to see more diverse content, it allows the system to sort of explore this space a little bit better and better understand what do you really like. We also find that because of that, the prediction error actually decreases. So again, you're recommending random content sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes. And yet this epsilon greedy strategy in doing so gives a much better sense of what you like and the error dramatically drops. And to see uh, this in another way, the left figure shows greedy strategy, the right figure shows the epsilon greedy strategy. And basically what is shown here is that it's correctly ranking what songs should be popular and what songs should not be um, in a way much better than the greedy strategy. So the greedy strategy says that even if a song should be popular, it may be very, very unpopular. People just don't see it. Um, but in this epsilon greedy strategy, because it samples the space a little bit better, the, the right content gets pushed to the top or, or the, a lot of people see the right content. And this randomness actually could be 
uh, considered as improving revenue. So while I would say it's useful just from making better recommendations, from a company perspective, it could actually be useful too. So in the figure on the right, we're looking at the mean popularity of content at a given time point. And what we find is that um, the Oracle strategy is sort of the best case scenario. If we had perfect knowledge of this teacher uh, model, which is not really true, how would it behave? But the more realistic case is, uh, is this epsilon greedy strategy where we find that the popularity of songs uh, is actually higher compared to the greedy strategy at any given time point, um, about 3% higher, um, which is to say people are seeing the content they, that they want to see sooner. And why is this 30% improvement actually interesting? Well, uh, first off, it's uh, well, it's statistically significant, but that goes without saying. But even a small improvement like 30% could be useful for, some, for something like YouTube, because at least as of uh, the most recent uh, uh, news I could find, YouTube might be barely breaking even or might not even be breaking even. So a small change in revenue could actually put it from the red into the black, for example. So to give a summary of results, we're seeing that the epsilon greedy strategy has the potential to make better recommendations on three different fronts, in create higher accuracy, in create more stable predictions, and in create fewer filter bubbles. Um, and in the last point, I should say, this is because the uh, content is forced to be more diverse. So potentially this implies that we are actually reducing the uh, lack of, of diversity that people see. And therefore, even uh, though I've shown you only the accuracy and predictions, the filter bubble has the potential to be even more useful at reducing, for example, polarization. Um, but this requires a little bit more exploration, um, as well as understanding impact on other systems. For example, does this randomness that I was um, uh, mentioning uh, benefit other systems? Uh, and I suspect it could, but we would need to um, uh, maybe adjust our, our algorithm appropriately for those cases. Uh, I suspect, for example, we could, uh, uh, you know, explore this in terms of um, a number of other systems that I won't get into. But but there's also an important issue in terms of ethics, and 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 of course we're talking about ethics here in this presentation, and, and that is the question of is it ethical for these decisions to be random. Um, sometimes this could be, one could consider this as an experiment on real people. While certain algorithms are making recommendations that are optimized, this is saying, let's see what else you might like. Maybe that's good, I, I would say it is, but it's sort of a, an ethical problem that's worth considering as well, depending on your particular uh, system that you're looking at. So to summarize uh, the feedback loop in AI, the feedback loops implies that there's a, sort of a maximizing accuracy, but that's not everything here. And that new strategies are needed to uncover long-term impact of algorithms. And that there's a lot of problems in the feedback loop. We've mentioned fairness. I was also mentioning the filter bubbles that you only see a small amount of content. Uh, for example, with ice cream, you would only see the, the vanilla and not the other flavors. Um, unpredictable trends like plastic love and also poor performance. I was just showing you that the error when you just try to uh, use the greedy strategy, when you try to predict what people will like is much higher and you're not making good performance. And then um, simulations can give us a, new, uh, a nuanced understanding of the feedback loop to make better algorithms. I was showing you in the beginning of this talk that PredPol was simulated and that simulation actually helped us understand how PredPol actually induces over-policing. And I was showing you how this sort of simulations of a different sort can make better recommendations. And so uh, mitigating this problem uh, to reduce feedback loops is generally hard, um, but previous results show that auditing and improving the algorithms is critical. So the status quo has been improve algorithms with better models and more data. I think that is a very standard approach to all of AI. But my critique is, it is not so much the model that you use, but how you use it. I was mentioning in the simulations that I'm using the exact same model, I'm just making slightly different recommendations and suddenly the recommendations are improving. So the potential benefits to uh, accounting for the feedback loop 
would be more loans to successful businesses, it would be more accurate credit scores, which could help with home buying and increasing someone's wealth. And it could be creating better policing if done correctly. And there's a lot of critiques about PredPol or any variation and a lot of valid critiques as well. And also, as I was mentioning, reducing polarization by having people avoid a sort of filter bubble. Um, and then finally, I would say there's potential for it to be useful for uh, less online extremism. Um, and for that, I can discuss uh, some various work that I'm uh, working on in this field uh, offline. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time. And uh, uh, please uh, feel free to ask questions. Thank you, Keith, very much. And thank you, everyone. Um, this was very useful. And I think that you covered topics that were are very complementary to what was covered in the previous session, which had to do with data privacy and policies around data. I think you discussed more the algorithms, the decisions that are made with data in all kinds of AI applications and contexts. So very, very useful. Um, I, I have some questions to ask you. I don't see any questions in the panel, um, but I do have some questions to follow up from what you presented. And um, I'll, I'll start with Christina. So you described all of these different aspects of benefits and harms with AI uh, algorithms and systems. But of course, all of these AI systems work within a context of an organization or a larger process that may involve people that can override or be assisted or be um, using AI systems in different ways. So um, do you think the, the same topics that you brought up do they apply to human only processes and systems? Do they apply to systems that include technologies plus humans? Or are they really are there really issues that apply to specifically to uh, systems that combine AI and humans? Are they, in other words, are these specifically to AI systems? And how can we view them given that we have lots of processes that are managed by humans that are not necessarily uh -huh. fair or just. Um, uh -huh. how, how do you view this? Yeah, so it's, well, human decisions are biased. So I mean, this this brings up lots of, I mean, I could go on for an hour, probably even one me to, to talk about this, but but everybody recognizes that human decisions are biased. I mean, that's there's research going back 40 years in psychology that human decisions are biased. And initially, the excitement about AI was that it was going to reduce or remove biases from individual human decisions. So we are going to get fairer if we automate them. And of course, we are, you know, AI has learned from humans because we are prejudiced in many ways. It will learn to carry out our prejudice in a way. But, you know, he, just because because we are aware that human decisions are biased and affected by impl implicit bias or explicit bias, you know, we are having people have trying to figure out ways in which we can be made aware more of our blind side, bl blind spots, you know, for how we might rely on something automatically even when it's false. So this is like implicit bias training, although there's debate about how successful it is. But even becoming aware, becoming more practiced about critical thinking, about it, being aware that you decisions might be, you might have some blind, blind spots in your decision processes is useful for humans. Same things have to be applied to AI. Of course, as AI gets better, there's an additional challenge that we might come to un unthinkingly rely on. We will trust AI so much and not even think about its recommendations, which will be yet another blind spot that we have in our decisions, which might so just we have to be suspicious and critical of all the decision making and i'm not sure if there's going to be sp special differences specific ways in which ai can be unbiased i think ai will be biased the same way that humans are biased and the only thing new that comes up is the fact that ai can make decisions at unprecedented scale and unprecedented time speed at present time and speed so there might be some dangers inherent uniquely to AI in, in how quickly it can make these type of momentous decisions. But otherwise, I think the 
biases that are implicit in these decisions operate in similar ways in humans and in AI. At least that's my impression. That's a very good answer. And, and of course, I imagine that we need to be wary of people adopting the recommendations from AI systems without questioning them or without without reflection that's right that's right that's what i'm hoping in the stu in the class we are teaching the very least thing the basic minimum i expect is that people are going to be critical about any kind of recommendation they receive from ais or from other things they learn how to be critical and how to evaluate for such hidden blind spots thank you thank you um I'll, I'll ask a question of you, Sven. I think autonomy is such a fascinating topic and, and you are uh, one of the foremost experts in it, in, in AI. And I, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, when, when we create autonomous systems in engineering, even if they're not autonomous, um, there, there's an entire field of safety engineering that looks at, how to deploy and operationalize engineering inventions, right? And, and it means that you have to take into account things like risk and things like measures to, to address um, any uh, uh, areas where that risk comes to, to materialize. And, and so I, I wanted to ask you about the, the importance for AI to be closer to engineering safety. Um, and, and also I, I've seen from NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, this proposal to have a risk management framework for AI. And uh, they talk about the kinds of things that you brought up uh, are very important because they talk about what can we observe, what can we measure, and as you said, sometimes if you have an autonomous system, you can't very easily measure or observe how it's making decisions. So, so I wanted to ask you about engineering safety and this idea of, of risk and risk management and, and designing systems with the oper operationalization of AI in mind. Right. Okay, so you know this is a complex topic. I could probably say something about that for 10 minutes. So let me give you give you a couple of thoughts here. Um, so I certainly agree, right? I mean, so AI is just technology, a particular kind of technology. And so we can certainly apply sort of more general frameworks that we have developed, um, you know, say risk engineering, right? That applies not just to AI, but it also applies to AI. Um, I think the, the issues often are that AI has sort of some of these properties that we really haven't seen before, right? So I mentioned, for example, that um, the adaptability of AI systems, right? That they can learn from experience, for example, makes it really, really hard. Um, and that means that we often need to develop new techniques, right? That, that before weren't that important, that suddenly become very important when we are talking about AI systems. Um, but I think, I think in general, you are certainly right in that, um, you know, we, we often talk about AI systems and issues that AI creates, but often these are bigger issues, right? I mean, you know, I try to make this a little bit clear in, in the context of, of unemployment, right? I mean, it's not an issue that, you know, even though we are discussing it now in the context of AI systems, right? I mean, that AI has really created, um, you know, these are, these are larger issues. Uh, the same thing, you know, others talked about privacy, right? Yes, AI systems bring some privacy concerns to the forefront, but privacy is a topic, you know, that goes beyond AI systems in general, right? And so, so in, 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 in some sense, um, you know, that, that we're often contextualizing things, you know, in the context of AI systems, right? It's just because, uh, you know, it's sort of new technology, um, you know, everybody's very interested in them. For many people, it's mysterious as well, right? And so, so I often think that, you know, if you could just, just to educate the general public, you know, and decision makers in politics and law um, about, you know, the, the possibilities, the, the advantages and disadvantages um, of, of AI systems. I mean, that, that would really help. Thank you. Um, I, I want to also ask a question of Fred. I think um, you mentioned um, the issues in common sense knowledge and the the connection of, of 
uh, really trying to have uh, unbiased representations of common sense and the world, um, how that affect biases and fairness. Um, I, I want to uh, read a question uh, from the chat from Ad Advait um, that says, are there ways to incorporate common sense knowledge bases in models while still not propagating the biases they encode? I think a more general version of that question is, um, can we maybe use common sense to avoid certain kinds of biases or can they help us uh, have more context about the world that, that will be helpful to fight biases? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, that, that's something that we're currently looking into. Uh, so we've tried a couple of approaches, both well, with, with limited success. The one that I'll talk about is we, we designed a filtering approach where we looked at uh, the rules that are the most uh, you know, stereotypical, so to say, and uh, withheld them from the from the model as we trained it. And that did help, but not a lot. Um, and we really do need to come up with more sophisticated ways to, um, to, to address this bias. And I think what you're saying about like using the common sense against the, bi the biased common sense would be a, a good way to do that. I think that's a nice idea. I also wanted to ask you about the, the ethics checklists that we see coming from companies. So you, you uh, pointed us to the IBM um, uh, toolkit, the, the 360 toolkit. I think they started with explainability and um, they, they have a lot of uh, ethics pillars and aspects. Uh, you see Facebook fairness flows that look at different aspects of the data processing to incorporate uh, ethics considerations. You have Microsoft's ethics uh, checklist. You have Google's best practices for ethics. So it seems that all these different commercial, um, uh, you know, companies have come up with these checklists for AI ethics. And I, I wonder if you think that they are reasonable. I wonder if you think that they are comprehensive enough. I wonder if you think that they're a good starting point to look at these topics. I wonder if you think that they're kind of trivial and kind of ways to prepare their customers to have answers to these things. What, what is the state of affairs in terms of these ethics uh, checklists and principles that you see in the commercial world? I think what you said about a good starting point is a great way to summarize it. I think that we always need to have our, our brains on when we're doing this type of work. And uh, I think a checklist is kind of contrary to that, right? We always need to be aware of like what types of biases can be in our data set, whether or not they appear on that checklist and come up with uh, techniques to avoid them. Um, so I, I pointed the IBM one out because I think it's I think it's a reasonable baseline, and also it has a, just a really mature software package that you know you can use to get started. Um, but it's by no means perfect. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, and I want to. Um, ask uh, Keith a question that was posted in the chat um, uh, from uh, Advite. Uh, feedback loops resulting in limited content sounds like a similar problem to the exploration exploitation uh, trade-off in reinforcement learning. Has this intersection been explored in recommendation systems too? Um, so that's a very good question. In fact, uh, the discussion of Epsilon Gre was in fact inspired by uh, feedback, uh, I'm sorry, by reinforcement learning. Um, I would say it's been underexplored. Uh, I'm, I wouldn't claim I'm the first one to have looked at it, uh, but there, there are, it's only been looked at fairly recently. Um, so yeah, I would say that there's sort of been maybe an overemphasis on um, modeling, uh, sorry, and making recommendations that are best and not enough on exploring the space. That's what I would say. Very good, thank you. There's a recent proposal of a bill of rights for American people uh, in the face of AI systems. Uh, so that, that should be drafted to protect ourselves against um, uh, be, you know, behaviors of AI systems that may be harmful in all kinds of ways. And I wonder what you think about that idea, especially in these kind of feedback loop systems that you talked about, uh, where we seem to have very little control or protection. 
Um, I would say that's a very good question. Um, you know, one issue with uh, uh, legislation is that it could be, it might not catch up with the times, right? The moment, uh, feed, uh, uh, you know, this Bill of Rights is created, things change and suddenly it's, it's a little bit obsolete and people have lost the impetus to actually make another Bill of Rights. It would be a Bill of Rights every five years or something like that. Um, so presumably if it's general enough, uh, you know, it, it could be useful. It's just a matter of, you know, saying that it, one should have it and being able to make one that could be uh, not so time sensitive is a, is, a, is a problem I would say. What a great answer, thank you. Um, and uh, before we close, there's a question about uh, the course that you all mentioned, the SCI 531, if it's available to computer science uh, graduate students. And um, I think Christina can mention it. I hope um, that students get more interested in the kinds of um, ethics and privacy courses that are offered and, and you choose them as your electives. Um, so is that available to computer science students, Christina? It's a, it's a PhD, it's a graduate level class. It is available for the computer science students as well, yes. Very good. So I, I hope many students that participated in the session will uh, take this class and learn more. Uh, there are two seats open, so. Sorry? There are two seats open, so, so run, don't walk, go sign up. Although there's a quite, quite a few people still waiting for the deep clearances, so. Okay, all right. Very good. Um, I want to respect everybody's time, so we'll close the session. I want to thank our four speakers, uh, Christina Lerman, Sven Koenig, Fred Morsetter, and Keith Burgard, uh, for um, informing us of uh, many things that I did not know personally, and I hope uh, everybody learned something uh, important from these sessions, and we'll continue to learn more um, in the future. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.